Blast straight through. So, are you playing your version of the Tenth Doctor or a different version of the Doctor? What? Uh, uh, is Catherine Tate playing Donna or a different character? Uh, Catherine Tate has played Donna. What? Or have you uh, shot a lot with Shooty and Godwa? I don't know what anyone's talking about. <laughs> what can we expect from the Doctor Who 16th anniversary? I don't know where I am. <laughs> okay. I guess none of those are going to work. You have a podcast. I do. Yeah, I do. That's true, I do. One of my favorite things to re-listen to throughout the lockdown. Oh, thank you. Um, Neil Gaiman, many other luminaries appeared on the podcast. What was what was the process of doing the podcast like for you? Did you learn things about friends of yours, people who maybe you admired but not actually worked with? Uh, what was that journey like for you? It was all those things. It was a, it was a slightly weird thing for me to do uh, that I did in a sort of mad rush of blood to the head. Suddenly I found myself doing a podcast and asking some friends to do it, who were all very kind. Then asking some people I didn't know, who were also very indulgent. It was, a, and then we had a lockdown. And then I realized you could do it remotely as well. So the second lot were all done remotely. And that was, then I could get people I would never thought of approaching. Uh, but I, I maybe had a way in with. And Doctor Who is very important in some ways. Because um, I, I, I read that Stacey Abrams was a big Doctor Who fan. I thought, well, she's coming on my podcast then. <laughs> um, and th there were a few guests more delighted to be on the podcast than Stacey Abrams. It was extraordinary. I, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, she was watching Doctor Who episodes before she did the reaction to the State of the Union address, I, dis I discovered. So uh, go Stacey, I say. <laughs> Another thing that helped me, and I think a lot of us uh, get through lockdown, is a lovely little thing that you do at the Miss Michael Sheen stage. Oh, thank you, yes. Yes. Uh, where some remote access to people, I think, maybe made it uh, a little bit easier to get some folks that otherwise uh, might have been tricky. Well, one of our co-stars, uh, Mr. Ewan McGregor, is here today. We've just been chatting about the very fact that, that he came and joined us from, yeah, we got people from all over the world and from all over uh, the, the place coming and joining in. It was, uh, I think it was one, that was one of the things about lockdown. You discovered that certain things were more possible than you might have imagined they were, somehow. So, series three of staged is dropping when? Do you know, series three of staged is that, I don't know, because we're now in a different place, aren't we? We're now sort of pretending there isn't a pandemic anymore. Um, but I don't know. I, listen, I would never say that to her because it was something that we just did on a whim to see if we could. We made one episode to see if we could and, and then said to the BBC and they went, we'll have six please, um, which took us by surprise. But I guess there wasn't a lot of content being made, so they were probably quite pleased that somebody was doing something even if it was just on the iPhone. Um, so we had a lovely time. I'm glad that people liked it. Well, I think I'm going to turn it over to the audience. Let's start right over here. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, my name is Stav. This is my twin sister, Oi. Um, this question is from both of us. Okay. Um, we both uh, really love everything that you've done, uh, but especially really admire your incredible ability to um, do remarkable portrayals of villains and evil characters. Um, <laughs> so, um, but we always will have a special place in our hearts to your portrayal of the Doctor, because that's how we were introduced to your... Um, well, everything that you've done, so we kind of have a question about that juxtaposition. Sure. Hi, I'm the short one. Um, so the question is, what are the differences and similarities both with your own experience acting and people's reactions to your characters with being so well-known and beloved for playing such a like, good guy character like the Doctor, but also playing all these like villainous bad guy characters like Kilgrave, uh, Kale from Bad Samaritan, Tom from Dead Waterfell, things like that. Do you mean which is the real me? No, but yeah, no, I mean, like, we mean, how, what have you noticed about people having such a connection 
to the opera, and then you suddenly blame these characters everyone's afraid of or is supposed to dislike. And your own experience with the differences in general. Yeah, I don't think that's really for me to decide, is it? It's sort of for other people to decide how they react to it. Because you don't, you don't play a part hoping to uh, manifest a sort of connection with you as an individual. You just play the part to tell the story yeah. and to enjoy inhabiting that personality. Uh, so if, if it surprises people that you do, do things that seem quite opposing, that's not really what goes on in your own head because, right. you know, actors are arrogant and we think we can do everything. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't know really. It's, it's, a, a, it's hard to be objective about that because it's an entirely subjective experience, if that makes sense. I think. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Right away. Hi, David. Hi. Jessica. Hi, Jessica. Um, I've been watching you since I was like 12, and I remember your first episode, your monologue and your robe. I did the same one in high school, in the robe as well. What, you mean you learned it and did yes, it? Yes, my heart, in the robe, and I used a uh, tap light as the button. Wow. Yeah. That's great. But on to my question. Um, so, what was the emotional impact for you when you left as the doctor? Oh, it was very sad. It was very sad because it's a big old thing. It's a big show, and it and, and you know it, it has a fan base. You know you're, you're very aware that you're in something that that people are very enthusiastic about, and that is humbling and exciting and a bit overwhelming sometimes too. So there's a mixture of things. It felt like the right time to do it and to move on, but it's still sad. It was still. You know, really difficult to, however right the decision is, it, when you've loved something that much, when you've had a formative experience and you've loved the people you work with and you know that nothing else you do will quite be like that. So it was, it was difficult, it was sad. Um, and also the idea that it goes on without you is yeah. both wonderful and terrible. Yeah, yeah. That you can be replaced is of course right and proper. But it does take a little bit of a moment to go, oh, oh, he's quite good, that Matt man. Oh, all right. <laughs> but then, um, ultimately, it just, it, you just look back on something as a very positive experience to me. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's David. Uh, good name. Strong. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, my question to you is, uh, what's your best uh, food experience here in America so far? What a great question, and I wish I'd been able to prep for it. Thinking of Boston specifically, any particularly good seafood stories? I got into Boston about four hours ago. So, so far I've had a cup of coffee. What, what should he seek out in Boston? Well, lobster uh, roll, that was really fast, right? Um, well, it seems that I'm actually more from Albany, New York. Um, <laughs> So what should I have in Albany, New York, when I'm next there? Ted's Fish Fry. Ted's Fish Fry? Yeah, it's kind of popular. I'm not a big fish fan. All right, you know. Sorry about that. Oh, well, you know, you got to get New York City. Yeah. Well, I'll find something. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. I, I mean, the, the Mexican food in the U.S. is great. Yeah. Because we sort of pretend to do it in the U.K. But you do it properly here, because you know, if you're closer, it's yeah, it's like <laughs> there's a connection. So I always enjoy Mexican when I come in. Probably say that. Hi. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for, for coming here. I hope everything's alright. Thank you. Um, and to be. So for the question, he actually just stole my question for uh, stage series three. Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, but uh, were you and Michael possibly working on another film or uh, TV series together? Or are you sick of each other by the I way? never see Michael shoot again as long as I live, it will be too soon. Uh, he just won't get out of my house. We have, a, we have recently completed principal photography on Good Omens season two. Woo! That is still to come. That is coming to your tell box. 
very soon. I don't know how soon. I mean, the last one took ages to finish. So it might be a while, but, it, but we have done it. So you, do, you have not seen the last of us, for sure. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the creative relationship with Neil Gaiman? What's it like uh, working with him on Good Omens? Neil Gaiman is, uh, is a very hands-on showrunner. Um, he now has about 15 different shows running. And he tells us that Good Omens is his favorite, but I bet he says that to the Sandman as well. <laughs> You and McGregor photo op, so if you oh, look at McGregor photo I op, got, well, I've got to get my Sorry, he's, he's got to go. go. Uh, um, I don't want to miss that. Uh, uh, what were we talking about? Neil Gaiman. Neil Gaiman. Yeah, no, he's very involved. I mean, obviously, Good Omens is a real uh, love project for him because it's something he wrote with um, with Terry Pratchett, uh, who he sees as a, a, a great friend and also a great mentor to him. And to get Good Omens finally on screen was a, was a real labour of love for Neil. And he was very involved every step of the way. And as the story continues, so has his involvement. So Neil is, well, he writes every word. I mean, he's, he's, there are other writers who uh, are involved in season two, but it's, but it's Neil's show. I mean, Neil is, is over every decision and is every, and is, but he's a collaborator. That's the great thing about Neil. Well, well, uh, he, 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 he could be forgiven for being rather autocratic. You know, he's sort of earned his stripes in terms of uh, deciding, you know, what he likes and what he doesn't like. But he genuinely enjoys taking something from a page to a screen. The the, the collaborative process that that is, and what he's done with Ken and our director, who's also a huge part of what you, of the finished product. You know, he, he, he's he's a co-showrunner with Neil, so together they create this sort of magic and. And he, he enjoys what you know. He enjoys it if you have an idea and he and gets excited and will, will make, take your idea and make it better and feed it back into the script and make you think like you're much cleverer than you are. So um, he's a he's a, a joy to get to know and to work with. Beautiful. Next up, right over here. Hi. Uh, throughout your career and over the different roles you've been in, what emotional scene stands out to you and see you faked it? The scene I faked it the least. <laughs> I never faked anything. Uh, ever. Uh, oh, I don't know, that's hard. Um, it's probably a scene where you, where you don't, you, you don't realise it's an emotional scene until you're in the middle of it. It's supposed to be something like that. And I'm thinking of one in particular that you haven't seen yet, so I can't tell you about it. <laughs> Uh, so that's my answer, which is really <laughs> helpful. Oh, thank you. Over here. Uh, hello. Hi. My name is Adrienne. Hello. Uh, and I have a question, yeah. but I was first wondering if you would say uh, your Doctor Who Chris, uh, catchphrase, Allons-y. Allons-y. <laughs> Is um, uh, when you were working on the Doctor Who uh, stage, who was the, your favorite person to work with? Uh, can you imagine if I started picking favorites? <laughs> can you imagine the abuse I would get. <laughs> My favorite was. <laughs> uh, there was some actress who played the doctor's daughter. I quite liked it. Yeah. 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 I can't quite remember the name, but I do remember her name. I think she was quite special, yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're very welcome. Very Hi, thank you for being here. You're so welcome. Uh, my question is, where was your absolute favorite place to film? Whatever, anywhere. Uh, oh, that's a good question. Um, the Shakespeare's Globe is an amazing place to film, which I've had the pleasure of doing three times now. Um, uh, also, obviously, we did it on Doctor Who, uh, but it's a great location. We've also done it at Good Omens. 
uh, I, I also did it in a film called Centurions 2 The Legend of Legends. Legend. 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 Legend.
what, I, what I think is interesting about the fact that Catherine Tate and I may have been filming, like, you see, because we were slightly unfortunate or fortunate in that we were filming some scenes that were in the public, so it had to be admitted that we were in it. So most of what's been filmed with other people is all been inside. So there's lots more coming than people think, which is very exciting. Um, and, yeah! and as far as I'm aware, nobody has quite figured out yet what Catherine and I are doing there. I think there's a lot of theory and a lot of speculation, but um, I'm very excited for people to see the tiny little cog that we are in Russell's great machine. So the answer is stay tuned, I guess. Yes. Wait and see. Thank you. Hi, David. Nice hi. to meet you. Hi, hi. One quick favor and then a question. My son Aiden has been a fan of yours since he's six. He wanted to ask, but he's very shy. He's sitting over there. Can you just say hi? Hi, a different Aiden. Yeah, a different Aiden. Hi. Do you have a birthday Aiden coming soon? In October, he'll be 16. That's a bit too far away for us yeah. to see as well. <laughs> It's nice to see you, Aiden. But he has a question. Yeah, um, yeah, you have played many different characters, and character development comes from a psychological perspective. What do you do to prepare for character development and then detach from those characters? <sighs> I don't know that I necessarily know. I think it's a sort of, um, I think you probably have to ask my wife, because um, <laughs> she's the one who has to put up with it, you know? Um, and I don't know, I always feel like I'm, that I leave work very much at home, at, at work rather, but I don't bring it home. I, I always feel like, like that I, I'm, I'm quite, there are quite separate worlds for me. But I don't know that that's true. I think you probably have to ask Georgia how annoying I am. <laughs> and uh, I would like to see what she would answer to that. But, um, uh, I don't know, really. It's hard to talk about acting without sounding very self-indulgent. So I get quite shy of doing it, really. I really enjoy other people talking about it. Which is why I did a podcast where I asked other people questions <laughs> and I didn't answer any myself. So. Um, I don't know that I've got a very good answer for that. And maybe that's partly because I'm nervous of uncovering the magic and it being revealed to not be very magic. That's perfectly fine. Okay, thank you. Go for it. Hi David, my name's Adam. Hi Adam. So, you've, over your career, you've, um, you've played a lot of Shakespeare roles, like Hamlet, Richard II, Benedict. My question is, is there a character you haven't played yet that you would like to in the future, or maybe one you'd like to play again? In Shakespearean roles, yeah. yeah, loads of them, loads of them. I love all that. Um, I'd love to do Iago. Um, I'd love to do Angelo in Measure Measure. <laughs> I'd quite like to do Bottom in Midsummer's Dream. I'd quite like to do Malvolio in Twelve Night. Um, uh, King Lear eventually. I mean, I'll be lucky to get through all of them, but um, that would do. I'd start with that. <laughs> Thank you. Can I ask you a little follow-up? Are there any Shakespeare plays that you think are particularly underappreciated or, or underrated, perhaps? Uh, you know, deep cuts as a Shakespearean yourself. Yeah. I don't think Richard II is appreciated for the brilliant play and the brilliant role of that is, actually. When I was doing Richard II, everyone went, oh, the one with the hump, and the... But no, there's another one. It was Richard II, which is sort of... Uh, I, I, I would say almost a, a more extraordinary play. Um, so, yeah, yeah, maybe that one, yeah. Although Love Saber's was Lost, there's some great oh, yeah. stuff in Love Saber's was Lost. There's also some really difficult stuff in Love Saber's was Lost. But if you can take out all the funny scenes... <laughs> uh, and that's a great, great one. I very much enjoyed that one. Right over here. Uh, hi, David. Hi. I'm Hannah. Hi, Hannah. Uh, first, I just want to thank you for being my doctor and making the show so special for so long for me. I really appreciate it. So, uh... And don't worry, my question's easy. I was wondering if you were upset at all when you found out Peter 
Capaldi could use his Scottish accent in Quidditch. <laughs> It was always uh, so I never really thought about it. it now, now seems like quite a weird thing to have done, but at the time it never even it never even crossed my mind that I would uh, that I would rather because it was what we and I'd just been working on Casanova with Russell T. Davis and and, and in that I was I was using an English accent because I was the young Peter O'Toole and blah blah blah. Um, so and, and it's sort of one character almost sort of was inspired by the other, so I don't know that we ever really, I never considered not doing it. So it never occurred to me, and it's only now looking back that you go, oh yeah. Um, Peter was, yes, a, a very Scottish, Judy was very Northern, uh, as was Chris. Uh, um, and uh, yeah. I'm gonna get stuff away there, I'm gonna move on. <laughs> right over here. Hi, I'm Ashley. Hello. Look at those wings, man. Wings are amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering what your favorite like costume or look you've ever gotten to wear for like anything you've ever been in. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> ever. Ooh. I do quite like dressing up as Crowley, that's pretty cool. Because sunglasses kind of make everything better, don't they? Uh, although the contact lenses are a little bit grim. Like week 20 of the shoot. Um, uh, I mean, I suppose I've been pretty happy with finding the look of a character very feels very important and you kind of know when you get it. And when you get it, it just feels great and you just feel at home. And, and certainly, probably was that, certainly when we were doing Doctor Who, I remember when we, when we finally found the costume and suddenly you kind of went, oh yeah, there we are. It just felt, you just kind of know when it's right, I think. So it's a, it's a, it's a feeling that you're in the right skin, I suppose. Um, and that's always a bit of a journey. And hopefully, it was just a moment. It's, a, it's a, it kind of intangible, but you're doing costumes for things. It's like, yeah, it is, uh, maybe. It's just a moment you're going to go, oh, we're here. We've we got that. So that's what you're kind of chasing. I feel like I've worked with some very talented designers who made that possible. So, all of them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name's Emily. Hi, Emily. Hi. Much for coming to Boston. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. Um, I'm such a huge fan of everything you've been and great actor. Um, my question though is about Kilgrave. Okay. Now that there is a multiverse in the MCU, yeah. if you were to come back, or maybe you have and you just can't say anything, <laughs> what characters would you like to see Kilgrave interact with? Oh, that's a lot good, isn't it? That's a good question. Captain Marvel, I'm hearing. I, I suppose the thing with Gilbert is he's quite hard to beat unless you've got a very specific skill set. So it would be quite, I suppose he could, I mean, he could wreak havoc with a lot of people, couldn't he? Um, so it'd be quite nice to see that with quite a lot of them, I think. And then it would be the trouble with. I think Kruger is quite a difficult character to write because it's difficult to get conflict. Either he can make you do anything, or he can't. And there's sort of that's quite it's quite hard to get a, find the story that works there. See what I mean? Because you've either got him wreaking unadulterated havoc, would be awesome. Which would be well, he'd like it. Um, or you've got. Uh, him just being sort of beaten up by the Hulk who doesn't hear him or whatever, I don't know. But the Marvel Cinematic Universe is full of some very talented writers and I'd be thrilled to see what they had to make of that, for sure. Thank you so much. Hi David, um, my name is Miriam. Hello Miriam. Uh, it's, it's an honour to meet you honestly and um, I hope you 
braced yourself because I am going to go in depth about acting a little bit. Okay. <laughs> and as um, you are, in my opinion, one of the best actors of all time. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, uh, I was wondering if you can remember a time when you got a script and your character did something that, in your mind, your character would never do, that it was clearly outside their their uh, per your per um, idea of their personality and how you handled that. It's interesting, isn't it? Because in a way, your job as an actor is to, to make your character do what the script says your character does. So if, you're, if the script says your character does something that feels out of character, your, your job, first of all, is to try and join the dots and see why that's happening. I mean, I suppose the only time, if it's a character you've been playing for a long time, uh, and maybe there's a new writer, then I suppose there's room for you going, I'm not sure that that's, is there another way we can achieve the same end? Um, because sort of, your character is defined by, as we are as humans, we are defined by what we do and what we say, so, as an actor, you have to go, well, this person does this and says that, so I have to make that make sense. Um, so I suppose that's the job, really. Unless it is a, like an ongoing thing, at which point I suppose you, it does come a point where you can sort of, you get to define that a little bit more than otherwise. I don't know, but I, I, I would, I, I think I'd like to try and get it a shot first before I kind of assume the writer's got it wrong. Because they are the writer, so they, you know, it's up to them, I suppose. Yeah, that, that would be my mind with answer. This is his master class. <laughs> well, thank you for that answer. Thank you, Reader. Hi, David, I'm Lorelei. Hi, Lorelei. I love you in Dr. Hooper, I also love you in Harry Potter, so my question is, what was your favorite part about playing Marty Cross Jr.? Oh, hanging out with all those people. Get, get to be in a little ring of cheers like this with Alan Rickman and Maggie Smith and Michael Gamble and Daniel Radcliffe and Timothy Spall and... Wow, it was amazing! Um, yeah, it was great. It was, it was just blissful because it was, the, the, it was all the kind of finest actors of every generation all in one room. And I, and I wasn't really part of the gang. Because they'd all been there, you know, for multiple films, and they, they all had, in fact, they all had chairs like this, with their names on the back, and I didn't. I had like a normal chair like that, with no name on the back, because I was just a little scrubber they brought in for a little bit. So I, there would be a circle of chairs with them all sitting around, and I'd get put on there, and I would literally be like that. Right over here at the children's table. Yeah, exactly. Listening to all these tales. But it was great. I'd have done that for my entire life, quite happily. Thank you. So next week we've got about five minutes left. I know that we're not going to get to everybody, but we can get to as many of you as we possibly can if we go fast. Go for it. Um, hi, I'm Alana. Alana, Alana, hello, Alana. Hi. Um, so I know you might not be able to say a lot, but um, I was wondering if there are any plans, big or otherwise, to make more um, big finish and Doctor Adventures with Billy. I don't think there are any plans, no, but I know that I've recorded some that haven't come out yet. So, I don't, I don't have any plans to do any more, but there are more to come. Okay. It sort of answers your question, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Thanks. Hi, David. Whoa. Um, <laughs> my name is Maddie. Hi. Um, I have gotten to the front of this line and no one has asked you about Broadchurch yet. Woo! Company from what I've seen, 
And I'm just wondering how filming something like that facilitates that. It's a lot of very silly people on that job, actually. Um, but who all, all take what they do very seriously. So there was, it was a very joyous time, which is a bit weird because you're right, it was a very depressing story. But that group of people, uh, it was a very, very happy, creative, fun-filled time. And then when we did the scenes, it was very serious and very concentrated. And maybe because of that, off-camera was very light, actually. Weirdly, often the case of thing when you're doing, because you sort of can't stay in that place all day for a 12-hour shooting day. You sort of have to visit it and 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 do a deep dive into it. And then when the scene's finished, you then have to sort of run up and down and throw cakes at each other because that's sort of and, and that the, the the mix of people who were on that, we all felt the same way about it. And we were all very very committed to it, took it very seriously. And then we arsed around a lot as well. So it was a very, I always think of it as a very happy time. Um, and I'm very, very proud of the show. But yes, there were two quite different experiences, I suppose. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marsha. Hi. I'm here from the UK, and my son is at the University of Edinburgh. Oh, very good. What's he, what's he studying? He's in chemical engineering. That's clever. clever. Well done. <laughs> and so which do you prefer? Shakespeare and stage or TV and film? I, 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 well, Shakespeare doesn't have to just be on the stage. True. And other, there are other things that go on the stage. And then there are, I, 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 I'm greedy for it all. <laughs> Is the answer to your question? I like being able to do both, and I am very chuffed that I get the chance. And so are we. Oh, thanks so very much. Hi, David. Hi, I'm Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Um, I met you back in Philly in 2015. Nice to see you again. And you too. And so this is the question that I wish the 14-year-old me had asked you. So, do okay. you have a favorite piece of the TARDIS? There's a lot of like buttons and levers and things, is any of it your favorite, do you love it all? Which, which Taurus are we talking about? Yours. Sure. <laughs> um, uh, the one lever that never broke, <laughs> which became the lever that set us off every time, because it was the only one you could rely on to not come away in your hand. Fair. So the big lever that did that, that was my favorite. Thank you very much! <laughs> Top of the class! <laughs> um, and my question is actually about Doctor Who. Uh, do you still watch? And if so, who's your favorite Doctor other than yourself? We watch every time there's a new episode. It's a family event. Of course it is. <laughs> um, and it's been, uh, it's been wonderful having Judy to be, uh, uh, to get the kids excited. Um, and, uh, We've been glued, we haven't missed one, and we're looking forward to the next one. Uh, so, it's, it, it has always been a family event, because of my family. And <laughs> it will continue to be so, I suspect. It, oh, did, did I miss a bit? Well, uh, you know, uh, favorite of the doctors, I mean, how could you choose? Yeah, I can't what are some of your favorite thing, aspects of what, say, Peter, Jody, uh, Chris, Matt have done? That's hard, isn't it? They're all very, they're all terribly clever. They're all very good, aren't they? Um, oh, I don't know. I mean, the doctor's the doctor. The doctor's exciting, whoever. And they're all so great. I, I, it, it feels weird to... I just enjoy... I still enjoy watching it. It's weird. When, when I first came out, I thought, maybe it's broken. Maybe I won't be able to be a fan anymore. But no, it turns out it's easy. So they're telling me that we've run out of time. I have one little bit of housekeeping to do, um, but I kind of want to override my bosses and take one more audience question. Let's do it. So let's do it. Hi, my name is Leanne Morris, and Hi. I met you this morning. Yes. And um, as you know, I am a big DuckTales fan, and I also know you from Doctor Who. Sure. And my second.
seventh grade band also did the theme song of Doctor Who. Wow. My question for you is, have you met the original voice actor or the 1987 voice actor of Scrooge McDuck? I haven't. I believe he's no longer with us. Um, unfortunately, I would love to. And uh, I, I, I think the legacy that that original show created runs deep because, man, I didn't realize how beloved that franchise was until I became part of it. And then they had the love that DuckTales has. And then the guys who uh, are showrunners were such, such fans of it that they created this show made with such love and care and, 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 uh, and affection for the original and all those wonderful voice actors and all the wonderful writers and animators it was all the whole thing was really a tribute to them all um, and I think I, it feels like what they created was a was a genuine uh, tribute to it which uh, we're all all of us who were part of that cast are, feel really really lucky to have been part of something that meant so much to me it's been great if I can ask a little follow up thank you so much Leanne. it was a pleasure Leanne's wonderful question, you, you read my mind, I was going to close the DuckTales question. To go just a little bit further, you look at a character like Scrooge McDuck and you don't expect there to necessarily be the depth of journey that he has over the course of this series, where he's looking at being a lost family member, yeah. being a surrogate father figure. What was that journey for you like, uh, sitting in the booth and recording it? Well, it's a, it's a different thing than, than acting somebody when you're in the room with everyone, because of course it's all done, it's all done separately. We didn't, the, uh, the cast never met until it was launched at Comic-Con, which was the first time we all were in the same room together. So the whole thing, you, you, I suppose you're being led by the writers even more than you would be if it was on stage or if it was on screen, because you don't have that. And the only when people you really have interaction with. Um, so we were all with their hands. And, but I remember the first thing they said to us was, this is a show about family. I thought, is it? Is that a show about ducks that fight like monsters and stuff? <laughs> um, but that, they were absolutely true to their word. It was a show about family and it was beautiful. So one little bit of housekeeping. Uh, when exiting, we've got two exits over here, one there in the back. Um, before we show Mr. Tennant a, uh, a send-off that only Boston can, can we get a round of applause for our sign language interpreters? Yeah.